let's turn our hearts towards worship. And I don't know, you know, these have been uh, hard times. I was speaking with a person this morning about uh, being without church for a year. There have been a lot of hard things going on in our lives. And uh, we can start to take our eyes off the Lord and, and feel um, separate from Him or feel some distance. And sometimes we just need to talk to our own souls. This is the psalmist in uh, Psalm 42. This is the one that starts, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for the God, for the living God. He, he's feeling some separation. He's, he's desiring closeness with God. And then he says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And so we're going to do that. Uh, this song, 10,000 Reasons, we're talking to our own souls. We're talking to each other about all the reasons that we have to praise God. So let's uh, stand if you're able. Uh, God hears you when you're sitting down too. 10,000 Reasons.
I heard uh, a non-Christian, a non-believer say once, you guys are always singing about your death. You know, that song ended, you know, with a singing about when our days are over. But it also sings about what comes next, and that's why we sing. Uh, John 3, 16, we're all familiar with this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light. And uh, John begins by saying, Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, he gave the right, and called on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's some of the 10,000 reasons we have to thank God, but it also... You know, just a check for me. We've come here to gather together, but also to be in the corporate presence of God. And uh, He comes into our presence, make sure His light is received. He comes to His own, make sure we receive Him today, to have an open heart. And uh, we're going to sing, Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King.
have a seat and uh, continue with me in prayer. Father in heaven, that is our prayer. Come thou fount of every blessing. We acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. Uh, we speak the word of your truth that says we've been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. That we've been given everything in Christ Jesus for life and godliness. Father, we confess that uh, you are always with us. As the psalmist said, where can I flee from your presence? There's no place that I can't go where you don't hold me by my hand. We think of Jesus' promise to never leave us or forsake us. Uh, that he would send his spirit, the comforter, uh, to be with us always, a sign and seal uh, of our salvation. And so when we invite you to come, Father, it's with the knowledge that you're already here. If there's any distance, it's in our hearts. And that is our prayer, that you'd remove the distance, that uh, you'd take away the worries, that we'd hand them over to you and turn our attention, our hearts, our ears uh, to you. That we'd be drawn back in close to your Father's embrace and that uh, we'd experience something of who you are today through the power of your word and through the indwelling Holy Spirit. We rely on these uh, for the ministry of, of what happens here. Father, I thank you for your gathered people. I, my heart thrills to hear uh, so many voices uh, singing, confessing uh, who you are, and it does my heart good. I pray that it would be, that we'd be blessed for being together. We ask for these favors in the matchless name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15 for another of the parables uh, that we've been going through. You know, I grew up in Kansas, and uh, a lot of you know that. You've heard a lot of Kansas stories from me. But uh, I didn't really get out of the state until I married and uh, met, uh, met, married Sue, and then we went off to seminary in Illinois. Sue had traveled all over the place. She was a pastor's daughter, but I hadn't gotten out much. Neither, the, neither, <laughs> neither of us had been out of the United States until the spring of 1998. And I still don't know why, but with no preparation, the church that we were serving decided to send us as uh, ambassadors to a group of churches, sister churches in the, in the Philippines. They sent us to the far east. I don't think people call it that anymore, but it is far and it is east. Uh, I mean, we got on a plane in Chicago and flew straight for 14 hours to get to Seoul, South Korea, got off that plane, got on another one and flew another three hours. By the time we got there, we could hardly stand up. And uh, we waddled off the plane, and the, the Korean uh, stewardesses, boy, I'm really going back in time, flight attendants, uh, they, they wished us, you know, thank you for flying with us, have a great vacation uh, in perfect English, and that was the last English. Uh, once we walked off the plane, we were in no man's land, not the, you know, beautiful a Chicago airport that we were used to. It was crowded and cramped and dark and, uh, and a bit shabby. And uh, we didn't know where we were going. We couldn't read anything. Uh, the signs, they were, you know, they were the regular alphabet, but huge long words. Anyway, we got pushed along with the herd. We found our luggage. Uh, we got swept around this corner into like a gigantic Quonset hut, open right out into the air. So we could see our goal. We could see Manila uh, City in the Philippines. But between us and there was like 24 gates. And uh, each one had an armed, uh, uniformed person digging through somebody's luggage. And I just froze. Uh, first time out of the country, I was just really terrified for an instant. The only concept I had of a customs agent, I think, came from a black and white film with Humphrey Bogart and uh, Peter Lorre. And uh, I think they ended up in jail, you know. Uh, so we were kind of 
scoping this out, all these gates, over here it said diplomat, over here it said Filipino. We knew we weren't either of that, but every, either of those, but right in the middle, everything else, every other gate said Mabuhai. And so we thought, well, I must be, Sue must be a Mabuhai. And so we sweated our way through customs and then got pushed out into 10 lanes of traffic, every kind of car and vehicle we'd never seen, mostly taxis, taxis all honking, and I froze again because I'd, I'd made it through the airport, but now I was lost in a city of 2 million people. And I had no idea. I figured somebody was coming to get us, but I didn't know who. I didn't know who to look for. And it was just a few seconds, I'm sure, but they were long, long seconds. And I felt fearful. I felt abandoned. I, I wondered what they were thinking, sending us over here without any preparation. It was just one of those moments in your life when you, it's probably the most I've ever felt out of place. Then Sue spotted him, and uh, she saw him first, the head minister in the Philippines, Eli Mercado, and he's a little taller than me, which makes him head and shoulders taller than all of his kin's folk, and so he was striding towards us, great big smile, waving, trying to get our attention, and the difference between those two feelings, between feeling lost and found... <laughs> And then not only lost, found, but then welcomed warmly. I don't know if you've had an experience like that, something that, that, that rings a bell for you. I hope you've all had this experience. Long before you knew where to look, someone was looking for you. He stood, arms stretched wide, towering over the wrecks of time, over the hectic fray of the world, searching faces of lost and dying people, calling you by name, his word speaking to you, drawing you in. Others wandered by uh, lost and remaining lost, but you were found. You were drawn by God and welcomed into the arms of the Savior Jesus Christ. So if you have a relationship with Jesus today, you ought to have some kind of reference for lost and found, even for dead and now living. Today is about a God who seeks. Luke 15.1 begins this way. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around Jesus to hear him. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus, throughout his entire ministry, uh, that was his audience. He was with sinners and tax collectors and toll takers and prostitutes. He never changed. Early on, the religious elite we're puzzled by this. They asked Jesus face to face, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why do you associate with these people? And Jesus tried to explain to them, but they either couldn't or wouldn't understand. Well, Jesus wasn't swayed by their pressure, their disapproval. His mission remained the same. His associations remained the same. And it actually started to get him a bad rap with the religious leaders in his country. Jesus, in Luke 7, quotes what they're saying behind his back. Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, he must be just like the people he hangs out with. It was guilt for Jesus. It was guilt by association. But what they couldn't see was just the opposite was happening, righteousness by association. Because the drunkards and sinners weren't changing Jesus, Jesus was in their presence changing them. The Pharisees couldn't or wouldn't see it. And by the time we get to Luke 15, the leaders are spitting this out as an open accusation. It says in the text, they muttered it, but 
I don't know about you, in English, when I hear the word muttered, I think of soft and uh, kind of under your breath. But the Greek word means to complain in a way that others can hear. They're standing on the edge of the crowd and saying, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. He welcomes them. Oh, did I say that out loud? I mean, that's more the sense. They're, they're saying it in a way that's an accusation against Jesus in front of other people. They still didn't understand Jesus' purpose and mission. And that incomprehension was turning into opposition. So Jesus, again, tried to get through to these men. Our text says, then Jesus told them this parable. But if you look in your Bible, you'll find three parables, three stories. Three stories, but they're all the same meaning. They're all the same point. And that's probably why it says he told them this parable. God is a God who seeks the lost. It's the simplest I can put it. God is a God who seeks the lost. Jesus' first two parables are are really straightforward. They have little need of explanation. I just want to read them to you, uh, starting in verse 4. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who did not need to. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus tells these stories in a way that makes his audience, they have to participate. I mean, which one of you? You have a hundred sheep and you lose one of them. Aren't you going to go after it? So you have to put yourself in the parable. Or you lose a day's wages. Each one of these coins was probably about a day's wage. You lose a day's wages. Aren't you going to turn the house upside down? In both stories, the picture is of a diligent, um, relentless search. Both of them say they look until they find it. They don't give up until they find what was lost. And then, the searcher doesn't only rejoice, but they ask others, they invite others into their joy. So, we know that parables are earthly stories with heavenly or spiritual meanings. Who is it that's rejoicing in these stories? Verse 7 is telling the spiritual side. It says, there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Jesus was a good Jew, and he didn't just use the name of God, even though God was his father. He just didn't use it willy-nilly. He spoke about God's dwelling place, heaven, but he was really talking about God. The reason heaven rejoices is because God rejoices. God seeks, God finds, and then he rejoices and asks other people to join him in that joy. Would you rejoice over finding a day's lost wages? Verse 10 says, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Angels in the Bible are called God's servants. The reason they're rejoicing is their master is rejoicing. They're looking at what he's doing in the world. He lit a light. (laughs) He sent Jesus Christ into the world. He turned the house upside down. And he is looking and he will keep looking until he finds the lost. And God's rejoicing so God's servants rejoice. How is it 
that the religious leaders who claimed to serve God missed his joy. How could they miss his joy? They were purported to be teachers of God's righteous standards. You would think that when they saw sinners turning to God, they would think this is a good thing. I mean, even if they, they couldn't figure Jesus out, even if they weren't sure about who Jesus was, when he started teaching tax collectors and the tax collectors got up and said, you know what? I'm going to give back everything I stole. In fact, I'm going to give back four times anything that I dishonestly took from another person. It seems like the religious leaders would have been pretty excited about that. Like they would have seen that as a reason for joy. Shouldn't they have felt, I mean, God is a God who loves truth and honesty. Shouldn't they have felt some joy? Well, we get a hint of the heart problem they had in the first parable. I think this is the only thing in those first two parables that needs a little bit of explaining. I'm talking about when Jesus says, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. The only way that I can understand this is that either it's just a detail that Jesus doesn't mean for us to make anything out of, or Jesus has his tongue in his cheek when he says the 99 who don't need to repent. I, I don't know. Let's take a poll. Are you part of, are you, are, raise your hand if you're one of the 99 who have no cause to repent. I almost got Tom. <laughs> no, we know better, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the religious leaders should have known better too. And yet, they don't seem to have known better. Uh, maybe some of you remember the, the parable that I taught about Jesus, where, I mean, where Jesus taught about two guys in the temple. Just happens to be a Pharisee and a tax collector. And it says Jesus taught that parable to some in his audience who were confident of their own righteousness. That's these guys. That's the guys he's trying to reach right now. People who were, people who were heard heard about 99 who didn't need to repent and said, that's me. I'm in that number. I'm not one of the sinners. I'm not a tax collector. And that's even Jesus in his mercy, God in his mercy, still trying to draw these guys in. I hear Jesus' word filled with irony and, and hyperbole because surely, surely God takes pleasure in righteousness you can't read the Old Testament without knowing that. God loves righteousness. He loves when people do the right thing. But what he doesn't love, what he doesn't rejoice over, are people who need to repent, who are called to repent, and refuse to repent. In Ezekiel, he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but would rather they turn from their ways and have life. That's the heart of God, then and now. <laughs> and that brings us to the third parable, uh, Luke 15, I'm going to read 11 to 24. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off to a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me, one of your, make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But... 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. His son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. God's not only a God who seeks, he's also a God who welcomes and restores. Follows the same pattern as the first two parables. Something's lost, it's found. A party is thrown But the thing lost this time is more precious than an animal or a a coin. It's a son. This son treated his father like he was dead. He should have waited till his father was dead to get his uh, inheritance. But he requests it. His father grants the bequest. The son cashes it out, probably sold property, animals. Cashed it out, went far into another country and deep into sin. That's the picture. Long, deep separation. Money gone, along with all the kind of friends that money buys. He was in need. The land was in need. It was in famine. Uh, This young man fell as low as any Hebrew could fall. It says he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. It's emphasizing he's working for a Gentile and he's feeding pigs. And he longs to eat the unclean stuff that the unclean animals are eating. This is as low as you could go for a Jew. How often even believers experience sin this way. We look for something in our life to take the pressure off, to hit a spot that we can't itch, to give us a little bit of joy, a little bit of relief, and we go towards something that takes us away from God, and we find that it has no power to satisfy. It leaves us empty, and we're in a far country. We're in a place that would starve the soul to death if we stayed there. But this young man came to his senses, and sometimes this word is used in referring to repentance. He had a change of heart that changed his direction. He started heading back towards his father, back towards home. He realized that he had forfeited his rights as a son. I had actually never noticed this part. The text says that when he demanded his inheritance, that his father divided his property between them. The oldest son, according to the Old Testament law, always got two-thirds of the estate. The younger son or sons split a third. So this young son got a third, but the father had already given the other two-thirds, released at least its management into his older son's hands. The father still had control over it. Uh, He still was the boss as long as he was living, but he had no more He had nothing left to give his younger son. The son had not only hugely dishonored his father, but there was just nothing left in terms of inheritance for the father to give. The son only had one hope. My father's hired hands are better off. My father is a generous man. He's a good man. He's an honest man. I'm going to go back and plead my cause Maybe I will find mercy and he will make me a slave. At least I will not starve. What a shock as this young man drug his emaciated body towards home to see his father running towards him. Dignified men in the the Hebrew world did not run. They didn't gather up their robes, expose their legs and run. There's an old Hebrew proverb that says you can tell about the dignity of a man by how he talks and how slow he walks. (laughs) So this 
this father throws off convention and as rapidly as he can, as soon as he sees his son coming, closes the distance. It reminds me of a portrait of God that is found in the book of Isaiah. This is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives uh, forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse forever, nor will I always be angry, for then the spirit of man would grow faint before me. Isaiah 57, 15 and 16. That's the revealed heart of God, then and now. And and how the father in Jesus' story treated the faint-hearted son. The the son began his speech. He had this rehearsed. He had his apology, his confession rehearsed, but he never got to finish. He never got to the part about make me your slave. He he said, you know, hey, I'm not worthy to be your son. But as soon as he started talking, the father recognized and received his repentance and interrupted it in his joy. You know, he, he calls for a robe that was reserved for honored guests. They kept an ornamented robe in wealthy households. And when a dusty traveler came in, he could take off his outer cloak and put on this beautiful robe. He put uh, the, signet fam- the family signet ring back on the son's hand. He called and had sandals put on his feet. And we might not think much of that. We've all watched probably some biblical drama about the time of Jesus and everybody's got uh, plastic-looking sandals on, you know. They're always bad sandals in those stories, but everybody's got them on, and that wasn't the case. Sandals were a luxury that slaves most often did not have or wear. And so even by putting sandals on the son's feet, all of the father's actions are saying, no, no, you can't come back to me as a slave. You come back as a son. And then the party started. Wealthy Middle Easterners kept a special calf. They didn't put it out with the herd. They kept it sometimes in the home. They pampered it. They groomed it. They fattened it up with all kinds of good food. It's like, have you heard about the Japanese and Kobe beef? Have you ever, so the father says, break out the Kobe beef. Let's have a feast and celebrate. And then some of the most beautiful words In the Bible, this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You know, all the servants who watched their master go out on the veranda and look down through the haze of the dusty road day after day. They knew his heart was longing for his lost child. And when the father got him back, and when the father began to celebrate, how could anyone in the household not get happy about that? How could they not enter into his joy? But there was one, wasn't there? There was someone who did not share the father's joy over this son coming back. This is verses 25 to 30. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. Must have been a party. He could hear the dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what is going on? Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. You know who he stands for, right? Who this is a picture of? This is a picture of the Pharisees. So the father went out and pleaded with him. And Jesus is pleading with these men to come in, to join in the father's joy. But the son answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. 
But when this son of yours, he doesn't even claim him, claim him as a brother. When this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? The eldest son in the story, as I said, this is Jesus' call for the Pharisees to, to wake up, the teachers of the law. They should have rejoiced at Jesus' coming and his, his mission to draw the lost, but instead it angered them. They felt threatened by Jesus and his popularity with sinners. The error in this story reveals a couple of interesting things about What's going on in his heart? His feelings towards his father and his younger brother. He says, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed you, yet you didn't give me any meat for a celebration. Isn't it ironic that the obedient son felt enslaved? I mean, we've already heard that the whole estate had been turned over to him. We're going to hear that. Uh, again, all the work he was doing was for his own future, but he felt enslaved. He viewed his relationship to his father as hard and thankless servitude. He tallied up all he'd done and figured that the father owed him. But the disobedient son, the would-be slave, who only just barely hoped for a little of his father's mercy was restored to the place of son and became the center of his father's joy. I don't, I can't think of another, a, a better picture of the difference between religion and relationship. Between the hard servitude of man-made religion where you end up trying to earn your way into God's presence and end up resenting him and his rules or the free relationship of being a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Here's another thing I noticed about the older son, and this is the one that convicts me. He seems to know all about his younger brother's activities. Did you hear what he, he let slip? I mean, the father's been looking down the road for the son, but somehow the older brother knew, he said, this son of yours who wasted all your money on prostitutes. Now, how did he know that? He'd been on a trip, maybe, or sent somebody out. He knew where his brother was. He knew his brother's condition. And you've got to ask, why, if he knew where his brother was, that his brother was starving, why no help? Why no rescue mission? Why not a delegation to say, come home, come back? Did he not understand his father's heart? Sadly, the Pharisees did not understand their father's heart, the one they called father. They did not recognize their kinship with sinners either. They saw themselves in a different class from those that Jesus was reaching. They knew where those people lived. They knew what they were up to. And their whole religion was about staying separate from them and keeping a proper distance. And those people have their place and we have our place. We're the 99. We're the good, obedient children. They were confident in their own righteousness and clueless about their father's heart for sinners because they didn't recognize that they were sinners. Well, the other, eldest brother with his sense of hard labor and entitlement refused to enter his father's joy. And the lost brother now found, the dead brother now living, becomes the center focus of the father's joy. I think the parable, you know, all of God's word, this describes all of God's word, but it describes this parable. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit, able to divide, uh, divine the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. 
check your heart. In your relationship with your heavenly Father, are you more like the younger brother or the older brother? One way to check this is how, how about your view of your fellow men, people who do not know Jesus Christ? Have you become so judgmental that you can't reach them? Those people? I don't know if all of you know who uh, Oliver Perry was. Oliver Hazard Perry. War of 1812, he defeated the British fleet in the Great Lakes. And when he won, he sent a dispatch that said, we have meant the enemy and they are ours. In other words, we've We've taken them in. We have their ships. They're ours. But I grew up hearing that very differently quoted by my dad. He always said, we have meant the enemy and they is us. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's from a cartoon he was quoting. Do you realize that there are no enemies out there in the world for Christians? I mean, there are victims of the enemy, but the people you meet... You were in the same place before Jesus found you. Whether he found you at four years old or 40 years old, he brought you from lost to found, from dead to living. And we have to keep that in our hearts and attitudes. We should recognize our place among sinners. Our hearts should swell with gratitude for a father who sought and found and welcomed and restored made us children and heirs with Jesus Christ. So the first and most important question from this parable is, have you come to know God as Father through Jesus Christ? You were created for a relationship with God as Father. You were separated by your sin, but Jesus Christ opened a door back into the family. Not only to be a child, but to be an heir of everything that he will inherit, including an everlasting, indestructible life. So have you come? Have you come? Did you come, but have you strayed? Have you strayed off into some far country, and now you, are, you feel the separation from God? He's not left you. He's followed right with you, but you feel separated from God. Sue played an old hymn at the beginning of the service. I don't know how many people recognized it. Come ye sinners, poor and needy. Did you hear that melody? Come ye sinners, poor and needy, wretched, weak, and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready waits to save you, full of pity, love, and power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to fill your need of him. Whether it's a need of him coming to him for the first time or a need of coming to him in repentance, it, th that verse continues, this he gives you, this he gives you, tis the Spirit's rising beam. In other words, the Holy Spirit allows that in your life. Come, ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Not the righteous. Not the righteous. Sinners, Jesus came to call. Let's pray. Father, the wonderful thing about the good news of the gospel is it is always good news. I never get tired of hearing the gospel, and I pray your people don't either. To be, have our life saturated with it, that what brings joy to heaven is lost people becoming found people, dead people becoming live people. It is the mission of heaven. It's the mission that Jesus Christ left us. Father, if there's anyone here today, maybe they've been very religious. They've known about your son, but they do not know your son. 
the, the chorus of that song says, I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. Father, I pray that you would do that for a person, that you would draw them and they would come to you through Jesus Christ. Come to life. Go from lost to found, from darkness to light. And Father, for those of us who know you, we, we stray in so many ways in our worries and apprehensions about the world and we take our eyes off of you. Some of us, Father, have strayed into sin. We're not living like a child. And I think it's dangerous to presume on the grace that you've given us in Jesus Christ. But as long as there's a drawing in our heart for something different than the sin, there's the possibility of repentance. And Father, I pray that we would come. We would run to you. We know that you will run to us. And then Father, finally, I pray that if nothing else, this story would create in us a compassion for lost sinners, the people in our lives who we know do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you'd give us the kind of humility and servant's heart that Jesus had. Jesus was never, never condoned sin. He was never easy on sin. And yet sinners loved him and flocked to him. I pray that you'd give your people and your church that kind of attractiveness because we understand our place in the story and we live in the joy of the gospel. Father, we pray that through the witness and ministry of this church, I, I would pray for camp that has uh, Palabra de Vida, Word of Life, that has been the instrument you've used to bring so many young men and women into the kingdom I pray that they would not grow weary in well-doing, but would experience daily the joy of being right at the heart of what the Father loves, what makes heaven happy. I pray that you would do these things, our big, loving God who seeks the lost. We pray for this and let all God's people say, Amen. Well, let's celebrate the amazing grace in our lives. Let's stand and sing this old hymn with a little new twist.
what love the Father has lavished on you that you should be called sons and daughters of God, and that is what you are. Go in his grace and mercy. Amen.